We truly live in the golden age of beer. Never before in human history have there been more brewers cranking out more great beers using a crazy variety of ingredients and brewing techniques. Whether it's pushing the haze craze into the stratosphere or creating delicious barrel aged sours, it seems like nothing is holding brewers back in terms of challenging the traditional brewing methods and ingredients that we all love so much. But one innovation from 60 years ago is still winning the minds and hearts of drinkers everywhere, even in the modern era of craft beer innovation. I am of course talking about the creamy, foamy, and oh so nice to look at, nitrogenated beers. Hey this is Ryan with Beer By The Numbers, and for thousands of years there was only one gas that got to hang out in humanity's beer, and that was good old CO2. And while carbon dioxide is a perfectly good and natural gas, brewers in the 1950s and 60s were wondering if a great beer could be made with another gas. With the advent of metal kegs, the scene was set for a brewing gas revolution. So today I want to dive into the history of nitrogenated beers, what makes them so different, and ask the important questions like, are there any drawbacks to replacing good old CO2? If you're a Nitro beer fan or just like quality beer videos, be sure to leave a like down below and let's get started. To understand the emergence of nitrogen in beer, we have to turn back the clock all the way to the 1950s. It was at this time brewers were adopting metal kegs at an alarming rate, and it was easy to see why. Traditionally, draft beer was delivered to pubs and saloons in wooden casks, which contained live yeast and unfermented beer. After a conditioning period for the yeast to do their work, the owner of the establishment would serve the beer either by gravity or the use of a hand pump. As beer exited the cask, air would take its place. And if you're a home brewer or just a beer nerd like me, you can already start to see a problem. Air is the enemy of fresh and tasty beer, as, like most foodstuffs, exposure to oxygen begins to break down all those chemicals that make beer so great. But all that changed with the advent of metal kegs. Suddenly brewers had a serving vessel that could hold its contents under pressure, meaning that a final filtered keg of beer could be sold to bars and pubs. Suddenly, instead of air replacing beer in a keg, CO2 could be used to keep the beer fizzy and fresh far, far longer. This was a revolution for draft beer. The consistency of flavor and texture of your beer became much, much more consistent. And as one intrepid company would find out, metal kegs allowed you to use different gases to bubble your beer. To mark their 200th anniversary in 1959, Guinness began marketing nitrogenated beer across the UK and Ireland. They called their nitrogen serving system the Easy Service System and began a slow rollout of draft lines that quickly won popularity with Guinness fans. While it's safe to say Guinness did not invent nitrogenated beer, they were responsible for not only making it popular, but for giving pubs and bars across the western world access to nitro taps. So why did fans of Guinness, and beer fans in general, like nitrogenated beer so much? Well, the differences start immediately when the beer is poured, as it has a distinctive texture and crazy looking foam. The unique look is because nitrogen, or in its stable gas form, N2, is 100 times less soluble in water than good old carbon dioxide. And when combined with a special dispensing technology, it produces a ton of teeny tiny bubbles in the beer. In the case of nitro beers on draft, a restrictor plate is placed immediately prior to the faucet in the draft line. This plate has a ton of small holes which creates a big pressure differential and forces all the nitrogen to gas off at once in a flurry of small bubbles. All these small bubbles rise to the top of the glass much more slowly than their larger CO2 bubble counterparts. And sometimes they f even flow downward along the edge of the glass, creating a beautiful cascading look. They eventually work their way to the middle of the glass and rise up to the top. Now after this initial cascade of foam, the beer will settle down with an attractive looking head of very dense bubbles resting atop the beer. This creamy head lasts a lot longer than carbonated beers and 
all those tiny nitrogen bubbles are much more persistent than CO2 bubbles as a group. Because of this creamy head and lower CO2 content, nitrogen beers tend to have a very smooth mouthfeel, even when the beer below would otherwise be considered light or thin bodied. Nitrogenated beers have always been popular with craft brewers for these creamy textures and unique appearance. And while there isn't a tally on the number of craft brewers producing nitrogenated beers, there does seem to be one major nitrogen related hurdle that very few brewers are able to overcome. Producing nitrogen beer that comes in cans or bottles requires a tremendous investment into the complex science that comes with making a self-contained nitrogenated vessel. While draft and bottled beers that rely on CO2 are very similar, recreating the signature texture of nitrogenated beer out of a can or bottle is an incredibly scientific process. Guinness used a special widget in their cans and that took them many, many years to develop. And as such, there is a lot of secrecy around how exactly it all works. Eric Wallen, co-founder of Left Hand Brewing, always wanted to package their signature milk stout in a way that recreated the nitro tapped version of it at their brewery. For that particular beer, the nitro tap not only had a nice creamy texture, but it more evenly distributed the flavors across your tongue lending extra subtleties to the flavor as compared to the CO2 version. So they began experimenting with widgets inside their bottles and over years of trial and error, eventually they were able to recreate the magic of their nitro tap out of a bottle. As such, their nitro milk stout has enjoyed particular success on the shelves of bottle shops across the country. And it's also one of my personal favorites. And while most drinkers would say that many beers are improved through the use of nitro, there are some people who actually really dislike the replacement of good old CO2. While nitrogen does create a great texture that enhances many beers, that doesn't mean that the larger CO2 bubbles don't have their benefits. Those larger bubbles force more aromatic compounds to the surface of the beer, allowing the drinker to get a great nose of hops and malt that most nitrogenated beers just aren't able to provide. In addition, nitro beers can lose some aspects of flavor like hop bitterness and lighter malt flavors. That's why you don't see a lot of IPAs on nitro at your local craft brewer. The different gas changes how the beers act on your tongue, and IPAs just don't taste as good on nitro. And some drinkers even think many craft brewers get away with blander beers by just putting them on nitro. And while I think most brewers think very carefully about how their beers will change when you change the fundamental gas inside them, I have had a nitro beer or two that, frankly, were pretty bland. I could see how if you were so obsessed with having a nitro beer that a brewer could forget to brew a great base beer to begin with. But most brewers use nitrogen to enhance already great products. And with their creamy mouthfeel and distinctive look, they will be around the brewing world for many decades to come. I can only wonder what gas brewers will try to use in beer next. If you enjoy a good nitro beer, or even if you don't, let me know your favorites down in the comments section below. And be sure to give this video a big thumbs up while you're down there. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll see you next week with more bubbly beer content.